You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. 
We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. Sometimes we need to slow down and remember the simple pleasures in life. Good coffee, good books, and good company. Come on in. Take a seat. The coffee's just been brewed. Let's see who we have in the coffee shop today. What a lovely day in the coffee shop. But of course, Jesse's Coffee Shop tends to have outstanding, calm, serene environment and beautiful weather all the time. Now I'm looking for a book. Is there a book on a table? There's a book. And it's titled A World Apart. Mel Go, how are you? I'm very well, Jesse. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, I'm more than happy to have you in the coffee shop. And that book, A World Apart, it's got your name on it, Mel. Good. <laughs> so why don't you tell me a little bit about it? Okay, um, so A World Apart is a gay romance, con- contemporary romance novel. It's my first book, um, and I'm quite pleased that it's coming out soon. It's the story of Ben and Donnie. Ben is a sergeant with um, a small town uh, police department in Georgia, in the States. And um, he's just in the process of splitting with his wife when he meets a sort of bit of a lay about that big redneck. Um, he's very sweet, but has, has a bit of a temper. And as Ben finds out, Donnie also has quite a lot of secrets. So they sort of fall in love um, and yeah, it's the story of how they how they cope with all the things that are going on in Donnie's life, um, and also with Ben's um, with the fallout of Ben's uh, split with his wife. That's basically the story. I gotta ask. You said Ben is a police officer. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Does he ever tell anybody he works with that he, that he's having this romance? Um, it is. Uh, no, it comes up with uh, one person in his life, um, Jason, his best friend and partner in the force. And um, yeah, the that it leads to it. It leads while he's in the closet. It leads to Ben being quite anxious about it. And um, when it does come out, um, there are consequences. And yeah, Ben resolves them in a way uh, that I don't want to go into too much detail. And um, yeah, there there is a bit of tension there. For sure, because obviously he's not gay, he's bisexual, and that is maybe slightly more unusual than if he'd been out and proud all his life. Well, I think it sounds like a very interesting tale, but that's such an alpha male type profession. And I know, I'm sure there are people, you know, bisexuals and gays in all walks of life. Yeah, they definitely are. And I think it's great that writing is starting to catch up with that and bring those characters to life and give them a voice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, I mean, I grew up in, I grew up when it wasn't talked about and into into today's world where it's something that's talked about everywhere and something that's being addressed everywhere and where, um, you know, bigots are called out for um, homophobia on a daily basis and where it is not okay to uh, be homophobic in the workplace and where there's pretty much... Um, organized um uh organized uh um awareness raising in most professions i mean obviously i know about the sort of real life situation a bit more in europe but um i did read up quite a bit uh for a world apart and also for my next book which has a gay character who uh, works for the nypd so i do quite like that world i like i like um obviously romanticizing it a bit because i write romance but um i do i do find it very interesting to write those characters who you wouldn't necessarily walking see walking down down the street and think oh they're different in some way they're just you know they they look like your alpha male but maybe they're not you never know I've met some gay people or bi people in real life who were alpha alpha males and alpha females oh, yeah. so Absolutely. it just goes to show they take it takes all types yeah and these days um, people who maybe you would have never known about um, are happy to talk about it and who are um, you know who, who can be both um, what we 
would maybe think of as um, very masculine or very feminine. Um, and they can they can be, you know, something that we never would expect them to be. And uh, it's OK. And that's I think that's that in my in a world apart. One of the things that I didn't want was this. It, it's not a story story that's full of homophobia. It comes up, but it's also not a story that's where Ben endlessly grapples with the fact that he's bi. That just that's just who he is. He has no problem with it. It's more the issues he has are more around um, what will other people say? What will it mean in my work environment? But it's not the only thing. There are other things that are sort of are making him you know, question his life choices and they have nothing to do with his sexuality. And um, he also has a child with his wife and um, he worries a little bit about how she will um, how, how his daughter will react. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to, I like to write quite real stories where people behave in a way that's at least recognizable. So it's not, they don't just sort of, you know, it's not a bodice ripper all the time and it's not, they fall into each other's arms every five minutes. It's, it's not just that. It's, it's all sorts of things that happen in one's life and that affect how, how we um, see ourselves and how we change over time as well, because that's another thing. Sexuality is fluid. People um, today, I mean, when you ask people who who say they um, they are <clears throat> excuse me um, they are asexual, for example, that's a spectrum, and the same is true, I would say, for people who um, identify as bi or even the newer term pansexual, which means that you know I don't really give a shit, who, you know, what you are, what your gender is. I'm I'm interested in you as a person, and I'm also interested in maybe things that are not just monogamy and marriage and children and um you know the picket fence happy um happily ever after. So all of those things in my writing, I sort of that's why I write. I write because. I want to express those feelings, not necessarily from my own point of view. I'm not writing my own voice. I mean, I'm I'm a woman and I I can't say that um, I can write completely realistically about gay men. But I find it interesting to write about people who are both real, but sort of separate from myself so that I can explore and find out what, you know, what, what that those communities go through. And I do have a lot of friends who would identify as being part of the LGBTQI community. Um, and I also studied gender studies at university and um, did a lot of uh, a lot on um, non-binary genders in non-Western cultures. So that that my, that interest has always been there, and that sort of all of those things come together when I write, basically. I think for the most part, unless you're dealing with a Middle East country, you can be who you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> and when you get into the Middle East countries, it's a whole other kettle of creatures, and we just won't go there because it wouldn't make a pretty book. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, there are stories. Um, I've got one on, on my to read list where um, the uh, it's it's not Middle Eastern. It's um, set in Israel, and one of them is an Orthodox Jew, and the other one is um, uh, is secular. And I'm quite interested to find out how that works works out because uh, that's another. Yeah, when religion comes into play, it does become quite difficult. And I live in London, and of course, I see um, a lot of different kinds of people here. And this is a melting pot, and this is a city where you can walk around in the burqa, and you know, the women, woman with barely any clothes on walks right next to her, and no one has any issues with it. But obviously, when you leave our Western bubble, you do get into quite a different story and quite scary stuff. I did some research recently on. Um, on um, Liberia because I was uh, writing a short story about um, two guys who fall in love while they're in Liberia. They're, they are Western guys and I, I haven't published the story. It's not it's not ready to be out there. But um, that's another one where I, I got quite scared by just reading about what it's like in Africa and that you can be, that you will be persecuted for being gay and that in some countries you will be killed if you're not careful. You might be get lynched, you might get to prison and not, never get out, or you might be put to death. I mean, some of those places are not safe at all if you're not following the rules um, of, you know, whatever the, that population thinks is right. Exactly. But I think it's also, like I said, great to bring those things to light. And it's, I, mm. I, th- I'm a, I imagine I'm not a writer, and I probably say that on every episode at some point. I'm surrounded by authors and writers, but mm. I'm not one. Maybe one day. Never say never. I just don't get any joy out of sitting at a keyboard typing. Now that little okay. red light that comes on and says on air, I'm in my element. I love it. There is voice recognition software now. You can speak your book. 
Yeah, but then there's still that lovely editing, editing <laughs> process that wouldn't let me speak my edits. So yeah. I think I'll stick to internet radio and podcasting. Okay. So how did you ever decide to write romance? Right. Um, so my... Um... My way into writing is I uh, this is when when you decide what who you want to be as a writer you you create um a brand for yourself. I I do have a background in marketing and comms as well. So if I do talk a bit technical please use that. But basically as a writer you have to decide what's your brand going to be and I decided well I need a pen name first of all. Um but not because I I want to not let anyone know who, that I'm writing books about gay sex. Um but because my, my real name is quite hard to pronounce and it's really hard to spell and it's not a lot of fun. So I wanted a different name. And um, then I also decided, do I, will I or will I not talk about how I came to writing? Is that going to be a secret? Because sometimes, and I'll tell you why in a minute, it has to be a secret um, because I started writing in fan fiction and um, that is basically playing with other people's toys. So um, there are internet for, uh, forums and um, um, databases where you can publish your stories for no pay because you cannot make money from other people's uh, creations. Where I wrote about um, characters from, uh, well, mostly from TV show The Walking Dead. And... Um, that's how the idea of my book came about as well. So the story is now not anything to do with The Walking Dead, other than it's set in Georgia. Um, but that's where I honed my craft. Uh, that's where I played in the sandbox for a long time. And, um, yeah, worked on my on my craft. And um, that's how I came to write. Because in fan fiction, you write about people. You tend to, especially the women, write about the people. There are some really fantastic um, fanfic writers who write brilliant um, adventure stories that are set in the world of Marvel or in, in the world of uh, Game of Thrones and other stuff. But a lot of the women tend to write about relationships, even when then they don't have to be sexual, they don't have to be sort of gay romance stories, but that's sort of the niche I fell into. And um, so that's how I came to the writing about re um, relationships and about, um, well, romantic relationships. Um, but it's sort of, I think I stuck with it because I myself find relationships quite difficult. So I, um, I find it interesting to think about how people react. And I have, I've, as I, I was saying, I did gender studies. I also did um, cultural, cultural anthropology. And I've always been interested in how people interact with each other. I like psychological everything about psychology and and, and just thinking and um yeah uh, finding out more why why do we act the way we do why do we why are we a certain way with each other and um uh yeah, and then I like to play with it, so I like to sort of imagine what a relationship could be like, and I think that's how I got to the relationship story so my the first novel that I wrote and will not ever publish because it wasn't very good was a straight romance and um that was a lot of fun to write uh, my book that i'm working on at the moment is a there's straight and gay romance in it um so i'm not i'm sort of not completely set on the gay romance but you know the last thing to say about may may romance is that it is just it's sexy and it's fun um, to think of um, two guys being sweet with each other and being nice to each other and also the sexy bits are nice to write and think about. Um, so yeah, there, there are all these different elements that sort of came together and I think they all came together and then at the right, I was at the right, in the right mindset when they did and um, just started writing. I think that, <clears throat> I think that sounds like a fascinating entry into writing and as an avid reader, I'll admit probably for the first time on air, I've been known to read some fan fiction, and some of it is actually huh? fantastic. I wish some of it would, could actually brought back onto a screen or back into the movie theater or what, depending on where the characters came from. I wish I could see, yeah. actually see it as a movie or a, a TV episode. You know what? Some people who start writing fan fiction, I recently did, um, I organized and chaired a panel at the Nine Worlds Convention here in London, and my panelists were of all kind of all of different walks of, um, of life and one of the, um, the the our token man on the panel um, he started writing um, fan fiction I can't remember the um, fandom now but he wrote tie-in books but he actually that he was commissioned to write by the people who make the show so these things do have and can happen um, you can go to to you know if you're passionate and talented enough and 
want it enough, you can get into the into some some of the um, uh, fandoms, definitely some of the shows and um, sort of like the Marvel Universe. I don't know if you if anyone ever could, but um, people have written comics after you know starting out in fan fiction and and actually very successfully either uh, tie in or sort of you know collaborating with um, uh, with the original creators. So. It does happen. I mean, it won't happen for me, but um, that is definitely definitely an option because the idea of fan fiction as something that we do in secret no longer holds. It's not something that's sort of shameful or it's also no longer something that most creators will in any way, you know, you, you will not get anyone to be angry with you for, for playing in their sandbox. It used to be different, um, but it's understood now that it's part of, I think, the, the wider... You know, we're all creators in a way when we go in the, onto the internet. And um, actually, they've understood that by, you know, us writing fan fiction in the time when the shows are not on air, we're keeping the show alive with writing about them and talking about them. So they appreciate it. And also, there's not just writing, there's also making fan art and, you know, fo- photo man- manipulations and all sorts of things. And um, people who draw beautiful uh, characters um, that are from, from shows. And um, yeah, beautiful. Um, also, sort of, you know, love romantic um, pictures. And um, the actors know about it a lot. I know this from uh, the Walking Dead fandom, but I know that that happens at conventions for other fan fandoms as well. People bring up their, um, you know, the the romantic pictures that people drew of the two characters, of the two guys, the two alpha males in the show. And they, most of the actors find it quite funny. I mean, not all of them will obviously be thrilled, but. Um, they don't. They don't mind. They they sort of they see it as as the appreciation and the love from the fans as it is meant by us. I also think that the creators of the of these characters and basically the creators of the sandbox you're playing in would almost be flattered that you care enough mm. about their creation, like them enough. And you know them well enough, which means you must be an avid fan. Absolutely. That's totally what happens. And um, I don't know, I don't want to go into too much detail because I'm not an expert, but um, the play that's, um, that was just on here in London, um, the Harry Potter 19 years later, that was written by someone who, um, I mean, J.K. Rowling was involved in it, but um, the guy who wrote it was a big fan of hers and he um, played with her characters basically and he had no issues. I mean, when when you write a book and then it, it, it's made into a film, that's the, you know, already a step towards, you know, you, you give up a little bit of control of your characters. Um, but, you know, you, people do have a much more open mind than it used to sort of at the, at the very beginning of the internet, it was, that there was much less in terms of um, legal protection against, you know, people people trying to... Sue, that there were instances where fan uh, creators um, who were fans were, you know, threatened to buy studios, um, even though they weren't making any money, and they still are. I mean, that's the most important thing. You cannot make money with somebody else's characters. So you can... You can, if you then file off all the identifying details and you rename all the characters and set your story in a different world, um, that's, that's the way out of um, being a fanfic writer into becoming an original writer. And that's totally fine. You can totally do that. But you have to sort of really change your story. You can't just rewrite, you know, the zombie apocalypse or whatever, as you saw, saw it on the show. I do think, like I said, it's a fun way to get into writing and a fun way to get started. I will have to admit that you're not the first author who's told me they honed their craft in fan fiction. And I, Mm. up until one of my authors in the coffee shop told me that's how they got their start writing, I never would have thought of that. Yeah, it's quite a few of us. And there are a lot of good ones too. So where did you get the beautiful cover? They always say, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> Everybody does. And thank you-, you very much on behalf of the designer for um, commenting on the cover. Because I, it's someone today, I think it was today or yesterday, on our sort of secret author group that we have with our publisher, um, which is, by the way, Nine Star Press, and they're brilliant. Um, someone said, it's like opening a present and you you know you're going to love it. If you get an email with your cover, they're beautiful. It's done by, um, the Nine Star Press covers are all done by Natasha Snow, who is, um, you will find her, if you look on Twitter, she's on there, she does some uh, commission work as well. And yeah, I opened the email and I thought, oh, because I do, I've worked with designers a lot in my um, sort of day job. Uh, and have had, I've produced quite a lot of uh, flyers and leaflets and 
books and booklets and all sorts of things. Um, and you do work with a variety of people and not everyone is brilliant. And sometimes you go back a lot of times and it's still not quite right. And then you just sort of give up and just live with it. But Natasha doesn't, you know, she's just brilliant. She sent this, we gave, um, we get a, a, um, a, a list of things that we need to send to the publisher before they start on the covers. And one of the things it asked is, so what would you like on the cover? And then I explained that I would like people, but I don't want, you know, this is romance, but my guys aren't, you know, they're not your average stud. So I don't want people with naked chests, not because there's anything wrong with it. It just doesn't go with my story. And I don't like faces on covers. So I, that's what I said. And then I sent a few examples, just of pictures I found online and said, these are the sorts of books that are sort of pictures that I like so if we find something like that for the book that would be great and then she went away and she found the the picture and um she did the the title and I just went yeah and we made some small adjustments and we played around a bit with the colors of the picture but I really like purple so I think that that alone just made me really happy to just have it quite purplish and just yeah I I love it I just really love it and I think it goes with the story I mean that's something that obviously um every Every writer hopes that the cover goes with the story, but I really think that this one does. Well, I think it's important that you do have that beautiful cover because, like I said, even though everybody says, don't judge mm. the book. Yeah, you do, though. <laughs> yeah, everyone does. Everyone says it, but it is it is quite important. I think it's it's slightly less important if you um, if you read, if if you're making a book for your fans or if you're writing in a in a genre like gay romance it's very much online so people on goodreads they all sort of go to the same community they recommend books to each other and on twitter you sort of know who the the authors are you know a lot of the readers as well because a lot of the readers also write and so it's quite um it's quite a um you know it's it's a, de- it's a defined community and um, those are the people who primarily b- will buy your books or will talk about your books and will recommend them and then the cover doesn't, doesn't matter so much anymore. But of course, if, it go, if you went into a bookstore and you look at different books and um, then you do need to have, have your covers be really, really you know, eye-catching and appropriate as well. Nothing is worse than picking up a book <laughs> because it's got a nice cover and then the, it's really badly edited. That's one of my pet peeves. You pick up a book and it's badly edited and you can't tell from what it looks like on the outside. So that's, yeah, absolutely. And and Nine Star are brilliant at listening to the authors and sort of really understanding the stories. Same with the editors as well. They're, they're just so supportive. They they will sort of talk you through the changes and the things that they're going to do. So, um yeah, it's, they are aware how important the covers are and, and the good editing as well. Well, speaking of editing, they mm-hmm. always say editing is slaying your darling. <laughs> Was there um, any one or one character or something you had to take out of A World Apart because it just didn't story forward? I um, Because when I decided I wanted to sell it, it was a bit too short. So I wrote quite a lot more. And um, I probably could have written even more because it uh, it is quite it's still quite short. I mean, romance novels tend to be short, but this is sort of on the pretty short side. Uh, anyway, I rewrote the um, uh, the prologue, and the prologue that I wrote was very much you know I I told and didn't show, so I gave like lots of backstory for Ben and. Uh, even before I sent it to the to the edit, um, to the publisher, I decided actually that doesn't work. So I took that out and I put it in in a different way. So I wove his story, his backstory, and his um, the situation he's in. I wove it into the story. So I did another complete edit of it. I've I've read my book about fifteen times, like covered really word word for word. And um, so the the initial prologue was that hurt a bit because it was quite. It was still quite, it was nice to write. And I, I like, because I learned a lot about Ben when I wrote it. But I decided, no, it, it, I'm starting in the wrong place. Because really, we, we want to start where they meet and not sort of follow Ben in his misery for like, however long, you know, the prologue was going to be. Um, so yeah, I did I did that. And then um, the book I'm working on at the moment, because the romance, the, the romance I wrote, I can't speak for everyone, but the romance that I've written, the, the story of Ben and Donny is very it flows it's a it's sort of it's a nice and sweet story and um books two and three also when i i've written most of them and um they they were quite easy i sort of knew where, where they were going because it was it was 
quite an organic story. At the moment, I'm writing a romantic suspense novel that has more uh, sort of pivotal characters. And I can already tell that a couple of the things that I wrote quite early on will not survive the first cut. So I'm already now, because I'm almost at the, at the end, I know that things will change, will have to change because my characters have grown and I've grown to, you know, I've, I've gotten to know them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a process. Um, you can't be too attached to anything. Um, and I, I would say uh, cut as soon as you can, because then you're not so attached to it. Uh, don't sort of try, try, don't try and fix it. Uh, it's better to cull it and start over, or start over with something similar in a different place. And then um, uh, you're not, you know, if if you haven't spent like three, four edits on it trying to make it fit into the story, then it's really hard to cut. So it's better to sort of, you know, admit defeat early on and and move on. Well. I hope you don't delete those precious words because I've heard that other people have crafted them into short stories and all kinds of other little things. Yeah, I've uh, got a first draft of everything. So um, the first draft will go into my archive. And um, also it's quite interesting when you do your marketing, your promotion for your book. Um, they ask you all sorts of things. Uh, the, your publisher will, or your agent will ask you to do all sorts of things. And one of the things that my age, um, my publisher asked <laughs> us all to do is write blog posts. And having a deleted scene for a blog post is brilliant because then you've got you've got a whole blog post and you didn't have to do anything. You basically just read it again for errors, and um, you've got like your maybe 2,000 words blog post, and there you go. And if people liked your book, they will also be interested in your deleted scenes. So um, that was that was good that I still... So the prologue, when I do my blog tour, that's that will be available. So everyone can read what Ben went through um, in the very beginning, basically. Well, I even though I'm not a writer, I think words are precious. Well, quite yeah. frankly, I love to read them. Good. All right. So, um, sorry. Um, Unfortunately, as with everything, there are bills to pay, and yes, it is time to take that commercial break. So, I'm going to pour Mel a cup of coffee, and we will see you on the other side. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. 687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com.
Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the the freedom to direct your health care not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your sites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. <laughs> Thank y'all for hanging in there with us while we paid those radio station bills. Yes, with every there is a cost for everything. Now, Mel, before we get too far along in the second half of the interview, I do have one question I like to throw at every guest in the coffee shop. What is your favorite coffee shop treat? I would probably say New York cheesecake because you don't get it everywhere. And my mom makes a really good one. But normally I just get it when I go to a coffee shop because they do, though, especially when I go to the States, of course. But um, sometimes over here they have them too. I think that sounds delicious. And I happen to be partial to blueberry scones. Oh, nice. I'm not sure how authentic they are, but I find them delicious. And that's all that matters. All right. So are you one of those plotters or pantsers or do you outline every little detail or do you have the big plot points? How do you turn the words in your head and the thoughts in your head into this book called A World Apart? Um, it's, uh, it's a question that you think about a lot as a writer and you get asked a lot and you hear you and read about it a lot. I've uh, just been to the Writers' Digest Conference in New York and um, someone there said something about pantsers that I hadn't heard or hadn't thought of before and that was that pantsers tend to rewrite chapters uh, endlessly and sometimes don't finish books for years and years and sort of start in the middle and work their way to the end and all of those things and I thought well then I'm not a pantser because I always thought I was um so I I guess I'm so, somewhere in between because I do know my story I know who the characters are I mean when I start out with an idea it's normally it's like a snapshot from a movie my brain works like um, a movie theater when I write it it shows me um, it shows me a scene it normally shows me sort of you know when I've got an inspiration it's people doing something or people talking about something that's how it starts um, but when I have the ideas it tends to I, I start with an idea but when I start writing by the end of writing um, chapter one I do almost all the time know the what the last chapter will be so how it will end um, I discovered when I wrote, um, read on writing by Stephen King that that's pretty much what my writing style as well. So he describes it as um, unearthing a skeleton from like a T-Rex or something like that from the ground. And you sort of can see the general outline quite early on. You know sort of how long it's going to be or you're going to know it's got a really big it's got really big teeth or very short arms or and stuff like that. But um, as you sort of work, work away, you chip away or you add the words one word to the next, you realize that some of the assumptions that you had at the beginning are actually not true. And something that I recently said to someone was um, that someone does plan my book, but I don't know that person very well. It's like someone in my brain is, is busy planning and I'm pretty good at keeping things in my, in my head. Uh, and, you know, the or what they call the multitasker. So I can do, I can keep lots of things in my head. So I guess that's why I don't write them all down. So in a way I am, I do plot, but it's it's in my head. It's not like notes and um, brainstorming on paper. It's not like I've got um, a flow chart or anything like that. That doesn't work for me because then I feel too hemmed in. Um, and so I, 
I have a plan, but it changes a lot as I as I work. And um, what especially changes my plan is when my characters start talking to each other or doing certain things, and then they just go off in a completely different direction, and then I just follow. And if I had a plan, I would find that would get in the way, because if I want them to do something that's in my plan, but they don't want to do it, then you're sort of a bit stuck. Um, also, what's, what's slightly unusual about me is I write everything by hand. So I start my first draft, or draft zero, as I now call it, because then you can have a really shit first draft and not care about it. Um, I write that in notebooks, and I tend to, or I used to write a chapter and then type it, and then write the next chapter in my notebook and type it. And at the moment, I'm just writing my notebook because I've decided I need to finish the story, and then I can edit it. Because as the saying goes, you can't edit an empty page, and the first draft is allowed to be really terrible. Um, Most people's first draft isn't, but it's important that you give yourself the permission to write some really shitty stuff. Sometimes when I write in my notebook, all I do is I write the dialogue because I suddenly have an inspiration for dialogue. Or I write quite specific scene directions because I always need to know where people are in the room. So I need to know whether they're sitting down or standing up because otherwise my continuity, when when my brain forgets its continuity, I get out of the writing stream. So I can't be creative until I've got this, yeah, the, the sort of the scaffold that I can hang my stuff on. And when I, when I type, that's when I make, um, when I make the words sound nice. Because also English is my second language, so it sort of helps to have to not worry about is someone sitting on a sofa or standing um, in the kitchen or you know how. And when I write dialogue, the dialogue is pretty my dialogue is pretty organic, so I write it and then I rarely change it. So it it's sort of that's the bit that's the sort of that I get the most inspired to write is dialogue. So I can't always do dialogue. For example, I can't do dialogue after six in the evening because my brain just doesn't do it anymore. Um, and because my dialogue doesn't like changing when I type it, I don't know why, um, I can't sort of go back to it. So I sort of need to take a break or then decide, okay, this scene is actually finished. Um, or, yeah, start again the next day or, or write it in a different way that I didn't think um, it was going to go in initially. So, yeah, I am, I am a plotter in my head, but I'm a pantser on the page, I guess. Well... I think that some of that sounds like outstanding advice for writers. And I think it is interesting how you put it that, well, there is someone that plans my novels, but I don't know them very well. That's what it feels like. (laughs) Do you ever just free write and let your characters run away with anything they want, even if it's something as silly or just to relax as fighting an alien? Uh, They have never done that, but they do tend to to sometimes go places that I did not expect something to go. So when I let them talk to each other, um, it's almost like, okay, I sort of knew how the scene was going to go and it was going to be another two pages. It was going to be 10 minutes of writing and then they start talking to each other and then I'm still there 30 minutes later thinking, will they ever shut up? And that's that's basically how they... They don't do totally goofy stuff. They sometimes talk about things that... I have no idea where they got it from, but... Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I think that's where the creativity comes into writing, because writing is both an art and a craft, I think. It's something you can learn, well, it's not something you can learn from scratch. You need to have an affinity, and you have to have some sort of basic um, ability to storytell, whether or not that's inborn, or if it's something you grow up with. I mean, if you read a lot, it also, if you watch a lot of good um, programs, so TV um, and film, but especially theatre, I, I think, um, and I'm a big theatre girl, um, you sort of, you develop an understanding of how a story works, and that's really important. Um, and you need to have the patience to write, because it is, it takes forever, it's endless. Even if it's a book that's like a world apart, just 52,000 uh, words. It took me six months to write it. I mean, obviously I was working full time, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make you any money, and it's bloody hard work. So if anyone wants to do it, you know, if you love it, then go for it. But if you if you if you're thinking of a, you know making a quick buck, that's not that's not going to work. I know of very few writers who make their living writing books. It's about three percent of all writers, I think, is the is the going wisdom. It could be even less than that. Oh, well, I happen to be a fan of one that does, but he's the only one I bring up on air, and that is my favorite traditionally published author, Brad Thor. 
and I've, it was funny, I was listening to what you were saying about writing, and he has one other thing, and I don't recall hearing you say it. He said, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. <laughs> so I think your way of doing things probably has something to do, and I don't know if he that's an original quote or if he got it from somewhere else. I should probably research it one of these days, just never have. Yeah, it sounds it sounds about right. It definitely does. I mean, um, uh, the... The pe- I think, I mean, yes, that there are definitely people who who manage to break through this mythical um, boundary, this mythical ceiling of making you know, a living, making your whole living by writing. But very few start that way. And a lot of people who get the big deal on their first book don't repeat that. And um, some, I mean, in some genres, you've got more than another, probably, who, you know, people who can do that who who can make a living just writing but a lot of writers who primarily write they do um they will either teach or they will speak um at events and actually they they will sort of lecture um that's one of the sort of you know it's you can't not you can't often get speaking engagements that actually pay but um that's something that they will sort of you know you pass on what you your day job is writing but then you sort of pass on what you do um either paid you know workshops or um uh you you just you know talk talk to your fans uh and stuff like that but yeah and even the writers who write uh to make a living they do an awful lot of um promotional stuff as well so they would be engaged in you know talking to their fans and doing interviews and um being on social media and um yeah writing little things for charity or writing little things for like George R. R. Martin um, a little while ago wrote um, some fan fiction. I still haven't read it, but apparently it's set in it's Harry Potter and Harry Potter characters go into all sorts of universes of other sort of famous um, fandoms, and so so people engage with their audiences, and I think that it is almost a job in itself. And I mean, I hugely enjoy that being on you know on social media and all of that. And I don't think I can ever dream of making all my money from writing that would be great but um yeah the audience building for all pu- traditional published traditionally published uh, writers but of course especially if you are or, or i mean you can't be an indie publisher if you don't do any marketing yourself you do it just doesn't work that way um but yeah it's it's that's uh it, it takes an awful lot of time as well and unfortunately that's normally unpaid you know engaging with your with other writers and networking and uh if, if you're lucky and have fans engaging with them i mean it's hugely fulfilling so it does pay, but it doesn't pay in money. Right, exactly. And there's, I'm sure, <clears throat> Mr. Frog is having entirely too much fun on today's episode. Mm-hmm. Oh, however, I'm sure there are things that pay other dividends, like writing those charities or doing those things for charity, things that get your name out there, maybe with a group of fans who aren't normally your core fans, maybe they'll become them. Mm, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many things I'm, uh, as we... I, I'm planning to do have a um, Facebook launch um, on the day my book comes out, um, and you know you, you sort of <laughs> it's almost like you start with an audience of two, and then you you build up really slowly, and you mustn't let that dishearten you because everyone starts off like that. Um, J.K. Rowling sent her book uh, to 17 publishers, I believe, and was turned turned down every time. Um, Stephen King in on writing talks about how he, I mean, he started very young. Uh, started started writing short stories, and it was a very different time then. Um, and he got rejection letter after rejection letter. It is you you grow a really thick skin um, in terms of rejections, but you also learn to to jump over your own shadow. Often you can't be afraid of things like me talking on the radio. Uh, it's not necessarily something that six months ago I thought I would have to do or I would enjoy doing. Um, but yeah, you, you, it's so, it's such a rich experience. You do so many things you never thought you'd do. You meet so many people from all walks of life who are so passionate about their writing and about, um, stories and about, in my case, LGBTQI issues, because my publisher is, um, is exclusively LGBTQI, um, publishing both, um, own voice stories and sort of more, more fluffy stuff like my romance, um, although my romance isn't that fluffy, but you know, fluffy things that are from people who, uh, write outside their own personal experience. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, the, I, I like experiences. I like to do things that I never thought 
would be possible or that I never thought would interest me. And suddenly I'm in the, in the middle of it and I'm loving it. So yeah, you, you might, it might not pay the bills, but it will, it will make you, yeah, it will give you something to talk about for sure. Well, I think if you can even just have something to look forward to every day, it makes your day better and brighter and more enjoyable. Now, There's one, I always ask for little bits of advice for those authors who are just starting along or just about to have a book published. And I know this is your first, but I'm going to pick on you just a little bit, (laughs) Mel, because you did mention you work in marketing. So what marketing tips would you give uh, small press and published authors? Um, I would say, so familiarize yourself with social media. That's the first and easiest and free thing to do. And don't do it when you're about to publish or when you're about to start querying your agents. Do it as soon as you think that you might want to publish your book or your short story or anything else, any kind of written word. I mean, I'm talking written word, but it's probably other things as well. YouTubers is the same. Um, any any content that you create, if you want to push it out there, start building um, your presence. And um, most of us are now familiar with some, at least one or two of them, Facebook, Twitter, it's, you know, that's the most obvious ones. Um, if you're, fam- if you're um, familiar with it, comfortable with it, with it use that, uh, make, your, make a separate writer Twitter account, call it your, whatever your name wants to be, and put writer or author in it, because then people will find it. I, know, I didn't realize I did it without me. So my, my Twitter is Melgo um, underscore writer. I just did that because I thought, well, I'm a writer. But people actually find you much easier, and some of the some of the people who find you by accident can, can be quite useful. But yeah, pick pick one or two that you're comfortable with. If, if you like visuals, do Instagram. That's really easy as well, and people love pictures. Link them together, but don't just sort of repeat. You know, your, what you've posted on Twitter, on your Facebook, and stuff. And then I think you you do have to have a website. I I did that just the other day. I it's just a good place. It's like a digital um, business card you can bring all your links together all the stuff that that's out there about you floating about you can put it there you can put your bio there and your books and have a blog on there as well um uh so yeah do the social media thing that doesn't cost you anything and do it as soon as you can and then the next thing is don't take things too personally so um don't sort of if you don't if you tweet and no one likes it it's okay just keep tweeting and keep talking to people or if you have a Facebook group. Something that I did um, when I started my, I did a, um, I made um, an author page. So I've got my own Facebook, but I made an author page just because I thought I should. And then I I did a little um, giveaway just to bump up my followers. And that worked really well. I said, if I hit 100 followers, I get, uh, I I give away um, an ebook copy when it when it's available and that like miraculously suddenly you've got lots of followers and people who are interested in what you have to say so yeah sort of plan have a marketing plan it doesn't have to be really long you don't even have to write a lot, lot of it down some of it just happens naturally um and yeah just if you follow the right people on twitter in particular you will find a lot of opportunities so the interview today, I happen to see that on somebody's Twitter, someone I follow. I don't, didn't even follow you, Jesse. I just saw it on somebody's Twitter and I thought, oh, that's great. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great uh, resource for writers generally and um, a great uh, tool to use once, once you've got something to say about your work. Well, I think those are great tips. And you're right. Social media doesn't cost anything. And believe it or not, word of mouth, social media, Ooh. and reaching out to the occasional writers is how I find most of my guests. Because even when I'm finishing up something with one guest, you know, after we get off the air, I'll say, all right, now, if you know of anybody else who'd be interested, pass on my information. And often Ooh. I'll send them probably the same graphic you saw tweeted out. Yeah, and I will definitely mention it to my uh, fellow writers um, because they're always interested in uh, having new avenues to talk about their work. And like I said, off air, I'm not like an agent. You want to be on the (laughs) coffee shop? It is come one, come all. I can't promise you how soon your episode will air, but I always give out the air dates just as soon as I have that audio on my hard drive. I don't give them out in advance because that way if something goes wrong and we don't get to record at the right time, I'm not holding a date for something I can't put out. Yeah. And that's why I do things the way I do. It may sound kind of odd, but for me, if I can't make good on my word, I feel doesn't like I let sound. somebody down. Yeah, it doesn't sound odd. Well, as I do with 
every guest at the end of an interview. Mel, why don't you give out your social media contact information? All right. I think I did mention my Twitter already. It's Melgo underscore writer. And my um, Facebook page is Melgo. And uh, you can also find me on Goodreads. I've got a Goodreads page now uh, as Melgo. If you put Melgo into Google, I'm hoping that all of those things will come up uh, because I've been at it for a little while and I've got a website now and I'm doing a bit of SEO on it so that it sort of pops up as well. But yeah, if you want to find me, Google Melgo. Look on Amazon um, as well. I've got an Amazon um, author page and my book is on there. You can um, order it now. And uh, yeah, so... Hopefully it's an easy name to remember and an easy name to find on the internet. Well, thank you very much, Mel. And for anyone trying to track me down, you can find me on Twitter at Jessie's POV. That's J-E-S-S-I-E-S P-O-V. Or you can email me at the station, Jessie, J-E-S-S-I-E at K-L-R-N radio dot com. And speaking of websites, yes, Jessie's Coffee Shop does have its own Jessie's Coffee Shop dot com website where you can not only read my blog post, you can listen to every epi- episode of Coffee Shop I ever made and let you know another secret folks probably not much of a secret but jesse's coffee shop is on iHeartRadio, itunes google play and many other podcast locations now i'm going to snatch a world apart off the table pour myself a cup of coffee and settle down with a good book and i will see you folks next time in the coffee shop